bit of fun in that crazy couple of days. And we're all pretty tired out. So I think this will be, this will be okay. a release from, uh, from some more technical talks that we've been having. And something that's really focused on human interests and human needs. So um, first off, y'all, look at this art. Like, <laughs> go to the store and buy a print. This was like 30 bucks. It's all the same. I used to be in on this and support, y'all. Okay, so let's get real. My name is Anna E. Cook, and I go by the pronouns she and her. And I'm a user experience designer. I've been doing this for about seven years, and over the course of my career, I, like all of you, I'm sure, actually, let me ask, how many of you feel like you've been impacted by inclusivity in a negative way? Rather, you felt left out. You felt like you were trouble getting hired. You felt like you were a part of the loop. Yeah. I think, you know, no matter your background, there's a lot of individual struggles that we all deal with. And uh, this one's really focused on people who have had trouble getting in the room, getting their voices heard. Um, and I can say I've dealt with it personally as well. I'm here to talk about these issues, issues of inclusivity and diversity, how they affect organizations and the products we release. But more than anything, I want to talk to you about what I've learned as a diversity and tech educator that can help bridge the gaps. So if you're a hiring manager, designer, developer, advocate, or just someone who can identify with the issues that we're talking about today, this talk is for you. All right, so let's talk about the elephant in the room. I am a white woman, and I live with a lot of privilege. And I want to acknowledge this because sometimes I feel people don't acknowledge that. And um, I'm here as an advocate. I'm here to talk as someone who wants to get diversity in the door, who wants to get diverse individuals not just in the door, but rising up in leadership positions, impacting organizations in positive ways. So yes, I am a white woman, and, and yes, it's part of my identity, and I know I have a lot of privilege, but I hope that as I speak to you today, you know it's not as the only diversity that you should be talking to. I hope that as we talk about these issues today, you take what you've learned and discuss them with people who are different than me and different than you. Um, in fact, if you're going to happy hour after, I encourage you to go find someone that's different than you or heck, in this room, just kind of chat with them about it. Like, that's all you gotta do. It's all how it starts. I realize that this is sometimes a sensitive subject for folks, uh, but I really wanna talk about celebrating diversity and leveling the playing field more than anything. Um, and so that's really what this is about. So what are we actually going to address? As I mentioned, I'm a diversity and tech educator and advocate. Over the past year, I've been instructor for Tech Girls, which is a nonprofit dedicated to reducing the gender gap in STEM-related fields. And we offer workshops for free to girls in middle school age where the impact is the most significant. Honestly, when I took that on, it was out of a desire to get something more that I could do uniquely. A lot of people can go walk dogs at the Humane Society, and frankly, they should. In fact, please go do that. But not everyone can teach tech. It's, it's unique, it's sensitive, uh, especially with kids. It's charged in some ways, especially in those communities. So to me, it was about giving back in a way that I could. But I realized there was a lot more going on with these kids than I might have initially considered. I've learned through this work how diversity has been systemically cast aside uniquely in tech compared to other industries and other parts of the world. While systemic bias is prevalent across the US and the world, um, it is the tech industry in this country that proves to be a unique circumstance. And honestly, when I say that, I know that Denver has its own unique culture. We're not Silicon Valley. We aim to be different than Silicon Valley, but we still face some of the same issues. We are sort of, sort of part of the same country, and a lot of our industry here has been based on Silicon Valley. We're getting a lot of Silicon companies coming out of, out of Silicon Valley. We're starting second offices in Denver, so we're still dealing with some of the same issues that they are. Um, and I can't necessarily unpack hundreds and uh, perhaps thousands of years of systemic bias 
the remaining 40 minutes, but I will try to discuss the gaps in our initiatives, the effects of the gaps, and the ways we can actually bridge them now. As we go through this, I'm going to provide you with some quick and basic facts, as well as historical references, so that you can understand what we're doing. I'll frame the context while getting to what really matters, the solutions. And by the way, it's bias. It's very biased. <laughs> <laughs> um, by the way, I'm aiming the solutions at organizations. I want to talk about the problems that exist and how to solve them from an organizational standpoint rather than an individual standpoint. So the reason for that is because I believe that if we keep giving individuals hacks for getting through organizations, we're almost casting blame onto them when it should fall to organizations and leadership to make real change rather than us trying to hack at an existing system. Obviously, for people who consider themselves leaders, for people who have power in organizations, I encourage you to take some of the talking points from this talk and figure out where you might fall short. We all fall short, pun intended. <laughs> the point I'm trying to get at is, like, be mindful. It's okay that you're not doing everything right. Like, I'm not doing everything right. And people who are here, who are dealing with this personally, I encourage you to consider this as what you're up against, what we are dealing with, why we're dealing with it. And, you know, I will give you some points on how to hack it, too. So, this is a Tech Girls class from last April. And I am beaming because I freaking love these classes. I'm really proud of these kids. And in this class, we taught HTML and CSS. Yes, I know HTML and CSS. <laughs> Just don't want to do it full time. Uh, with a lot of pressure. <laughs> but if you're a teacher, you likely know that each person learns differently. Even if you're not a teacher, you probably know that because you learn. We all have our own experiences that changes how we learn things. And I'm going to tell you a story of what really happened in this class that, yes, is anecdotal, but actually fits into a much larger trend. Jane, I totally forgot to stop playing the music. <laughs> Jane is a 13 year old girl. And this isn't her real name, this is just a, a name I've come up with to protect her identity. But Jane is a 13 year old girl who attended this class. This actually happened, and this was the first time she took a class with me and through Tech Girls. She had taken computer classes at school, and Jane was brought to this class with her sister because her parents thought it'd be fun. It's free, and it gives the parents three free hours on Saturday, which, like, win, super win. If I were a parent, I would totally do it. Um, but Jane and her sister were both typical preteen girls. Sassy, very sassy, and vivacious. But when it came time for Jane to open her computer and begin coding, she looked at me quietly and said, I'm not very good at coding, Miss Anna. But over the course of the class, I saw Jane transform. She went from being doubtful of being capable to building a website in less than three hours. And before the end of the class, Jane came up and showed us how to apply CSS to HTML elements. Which, you know, for a 13-year-old kid who just picked this up for the first time, it's pretty rad. And as she stood up there, I saw her begin to believe that she actually was already technical before she walked into this class. And this is not a situation that is specific to Jane. I've seen countless girls come to these classes believing that they're not technical enough leave empowered. I'm getting chills. <laughs> In fact, I personally had the same experience. I started coding at the age of 13. You might not know that about me, but I did. And I didn't believe I was in any way technical until quite recently. When I graduated from college, I was offered a user experience junior role and a front-end developer junior role. And I chose the user experience role because I didn't believe I was technical enough to be a front-end developer. But I like UX, so it worked out. No biggie. Uh, now, though, I'm pursuing a master's in engineering at CU Boulder. 
or rather, starting next week. I'll be focusing on human-computer interaction, and I do believe I'm capable of it. A lot has changed for me, and a lot changes for these kids from the moment they start learning to the moment they apply for a job. The story here is not about me being a great teacher, which, let's be real, I am. <laughs> it's about the little things we have to do to bridge the gaps for marginalized individuals. How nuanced these issues can be. It's not as simple as hiring initiatives alone. So what would happen if Jean wasn't empowered in my class? Would she have continued she was, to believe she wasn't technical and then never try? Or what if Jane, despite being empowered now, doesn't have the same educational resources as, say, someone named John? What if she doesn't have access to higher education to the same capacity as John? Will your hiring programs or managers, even with diversity initiatives, look at her as showing enough merit to be worthy of the job? We've seen the answer to be no. Many hiring managers will tell you that they want to hire more diverse candidates, and they actually do mean that. Most people do. But what they don't know, or what they might not say, is that not enough, not diverse candidates are applying. And when they do tell you that, they, they mean it. They just don't think they're qualified. They don't think there's enough applying. They can't you know, bring someone in that doesn't have the accepted criteria of experience. It's, it's a thing we're dealing with. But like I said, these gaps don't start from the moment someone starts applying for the jobs you're posting. They start at the moment that someone begins to learn and grow. And they keep going long after someone has started their career. And that's essentially where the gaps live. It's where our best intentions don't see. Yes, hiring initiatives are absolutely amazing and should be encouraged. But we can't do that alone. So let's talk about what we can do. Let's talk about what exists now, what we're dealing with right now. The current state of diversity in tech. 25% of competing jobs in the US are held by women. And that's a pretty low number, considering that 50% of the population is women. And in most other industries, 50% of the demographic is women. Now, that being said, I will acknowledge that there are other cases where women are either more or less represented in certain industries. However, we should consider this pretty concerning given that we consider ourselves a pretty new industry and innovative. We shouldn't have these gaps, right? But we do. And what's most fascinating about this is that women dominated programming careers until the mid-60s because typing was considered women's work. It's crazy to me. Like, I didn't even know this until very recently, but, and now I'm like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. But here's what happened. There was a gap between the amount of programmers that were available and the companies that needed programmers. There was not enough. And so, two psychologists, both male, named William Cannon and Dallas Perry, were hired to make an ideal programmer persona that companies used to start hiring anti-social white men based on the criteria they outlined. They literally said anti-social. I lost my place. They hired anti-social white men over women and women of color. And while there's nothing wrong with being nerdy or male or white, obviously, it's, it's more about if 90% of the people making our products fit into the same demographic, we're going to end up with products and solutions that are inherently biased. So it's a huge issue. 25% is still a lot better than where we've been, but we've got a lot of growing to do. Now, 2.7% of venture capitalist funded startups have female CEOs. And here's what that means. Venture capitalists are basically investors and they often invest in startups. These are the people who have given us Facebook, Uber, and more. And for reference, currently, 91% of venture capitalists are male. So we're seeing a trend where men invest in men-owned, male, excuse me, owned and operated companies. Why? This can most likely be answered by the 
history of the web and the people who won big at the end of the big dot-com boom. Some of our biggest adventure, excuse me, investors are Jeff Bezos, Peter Thiel, Elon Musk. These are the men who, without really knowing, benefited from this stereotype and they won really big. And it's not just these men, but it's a large collective of men who won big and benefited from that stereotype established. The same practices are applied in who they invest in and who they hire. These individuals, like all individuals, have a tendency to hire people they know and like. And in general, we'll talk about this more, the people we know and like are people like ourselves. Now, the third thing I want to mention. Four percent of computing jobs in the U.S. are held by women of color. That's crazy low, crazy low. And um, to break this up, the percentage is three percent black women and one percent Latinas. Now for the purposes of this talk, a lot of the data I gathered was more specific to gender-only issues. Race and ethnicity data coming second and other data coming much later, things like sexual orientation, ability, etc. And I do believe this reflects some of the problem of what we're dealing with currently in this industry. For us to be truly intersectional, truly diverse, we have to consider gender and race, but also se uh, sexual orientation, ability, age. We have to be diverse in how we release that data publicly. So this is me not only just talking about not having a lot of data about those types of individuals, but to put a call out there to companies to start being more publicly accountable for it. So now that you know a little bit about the gaps, just a broad framework uh, of what exists out there, let's talk about how they came, or excuse me, and how they came to exist. Let's talk a little bit about why you should actually build a diverse team you know, besides from being good people. Um, like, here's the business reason. Now, here's a scenario. How would you feel about someone who thought things like this? A black or Latino person is less likely to pay a loan on, off on time. A person called John makes a better engineer than a person called Jane. And a black man is more likely to be a repeat offender than a white man. That sounds like a super sexist, racist person, right? Oh my god. But this, these are the decisions that algorithms have already made and will continue to make. And the reason they do this is not because they're not well made. Algorithms are adept, and excuse me, algorithms, AI, other types of very intelligent software are adept at learning quickly and well, but when the thing you're learning from is inherently biased, you're going to learn those same biases. We see the same thing in children. So yes, we're seeing technology, especially as we get to an era of super intelligent technology, that is learning bias, that is repeating bias. That's one reason that you really definitely should be considering to have diverse teams because your code, your products, will be built for larger audiences. It will not be built with inherent biases the way that these are. And not only that, but the lack of objectivity often leads to technology that just doesn't profit as well. For example, when YouTube first rolled out its iOS app for uploading video, Five to ten percent of videos were uploaded upside down because the company's almost exclusively right-handed developer team didn't account for left-handed individuals. This is this is truly where we end up with some issues. Like it's not even necessarily just excuse me, I shouldn't say just, it's not just about your background or your you know gender. It's something as simple as that that can really affect your products and like Five to ten percent when it comes down to money is a big gap. So, in a report conducted by McKinsey and Company in 2017, 1,000 companies were analyzed on their diversity and correlation between diversity and profit. 
This study also measured long-term value creation from diversity initiatives. And here are a few things they found. Diverse companies are 35% more likely to outperform those without diversity initiatives. And companies with high amounts of gender diversity are 21% more likely to have better financial return. Now, like I said, there's obviously a moral reason, but if you need a business reason, it's here. And if you want to learn more about this, I will share out that report because it is really in-depth. Fascinating stuff. Um, and these were only just two findings from that report. Now for us, these numbers are correlated to launching products that have been designed, developed, and tested with consideration towards biases. Let me use the example of accessibility. We had some great accessibility talks from this conference. And part of the reason that we're actually seeing accessibility come to the forefront of what we do is because accessible products make more money. Accessible products have been shown to have 28% higher revenue and two times more net income. Some of the best known features in your iPhone, like Siri, were originally developed with accessibility in mind. And this is where universal design comes into play. Who likes captioning on their Netflix? Like, I love it, especially when I'm watching the absurd amount of British dramas I watch. I mean, I can't understand some things that they're saying. It helps me to see that, it helps me to read that. So, accessible design falls into the category of better design, better development. Now, let's talk a little bit about some other region, reasons to have a more diverse team. Better retention. On top of increasing profits, diverse teams with inclusive cultures also tend to cut on costs. Happy people tend to be 20% more productive at work, which isn't surprising to me. Um, and they're more likely to stay at a company longer. We will talk more on the effects of inclusive culture in a minute, too, so hold on tight. Less lawsuits. Ooh. I hate, I hate having to bring up lawsuits because honestly, if your reasoning for doing something is purely based on lawsuits, there's gonna be some you know issues with the implementation. That being said, it is a very fair consideration. And over the years, we've seen companies are even paid for the consequences of leadership ignoring toxic work cultures and building biased products. Avoiding lawsuits and poor reputation would be the first reason, but it is a reason. And has anyone, just for my reference, I'm sure over the past few days, you've all at least once heard of this Domino's lawsuit. Yes, yeah, this falls right into that category. Just for your reference, if you haven't heard, in 2018, the number of federal web accessibility lawsuits nearly tripled. And it's going to stay pretty high. And the significance of this can't be emphasized in a few words alone, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention this component of what we're dealing with. Dealing with lawsuits is one thing, but the cost is insurmountable when rebuilding a broken reputation. Okay, so. Whew, we talked about history and statistics and, you know, a lot of statistics and numbers. That's great. Numbers are great. But, okay, you know this. We all know this. Probably at this point you've all heard about the, the diversity gap that we're already experiencing. I have proved it generally. We'll talk about it if you want to. But let's talk about why you're actually here, the solutions, the things you can be doing now to build better and more diverse teams. One, oh my goodness gracious, go back. <laughs> what? Too far. Okay. Start accepting candidates from non-traditional educational institutions and backgrounds. And better yet, start hiring people who are self-taught as long as they're good. I'm sure you've all noticed, and especially here at this conference, a significant rise in the number of tech employees that come from boot camps. And say what we will, but it has to reduce the barrier to entry for people looking to get into tech. This is an essential part of diversity, as building tradition, excuse me, as the traditional education institution cost has become 
completely unreasonable for so many people. And for your reference, the cost of the average coding bootcamp is about $12,000, and the cost of the average four-year computer science degree is about $168,000, which makes me want to like throw up a little bit. Student loan debt's scary. That's about 14 times higher. And if you would get the same job by paying $12,000 versus $168,000, yeah, I, I go for that too. I wish I had known about it back in my day. Now, while some of us are concerned about the job market, I would argue that those of us already in this industry don't actually have that much to worry about because we're already experienced, we're already living with more experience than most of these boot camp graduates. Our job is not to make it harder for others to get into this industry for the sake of job security. And if the market becomes more competitive, I say good, I'm here for it, like, let's do it. All right, number two, start hiring more juniors. And invest in training them along with the rest of your team. Train, I need training, juniors need training, seniors need training, everyone needs training, the world's always changing. We're in a competitive hiring market, regardless of the fact that we have more boot camp graduates than ever. And we keep hearing hiring individuals, excuse me, whatever, managers, hiring people, they're saying that they can't find good talent, and yet we're hearing good talent say that they can't get a foot in the door. Is it possible that we're keeping juniors out with unattainable qualifications out of a fear for not hiring someone who's good? Your advantage comes from not just hiring diverse candidates, but hiring diverse candidates who are ready to level up. So, <laughs> I'm going to grab a drink of water here. Raise your hand if when you finished school, you felt like you had to deal with this. Hydration. I did too. <laughs> Let's talk. <laughs> um, by the way, since I'm saying that, I'm going to be at the happy hour and, like, please talk to me. Like, I want to talk to you about that just because I want to know. I'm not, I'm not going to convince you otherwise. So, let's talk. Um, so, yes, that is a real thing that we're dealing with. And I can say that after graduating from CU Boulder with a qualified degree, it still took me, oh, and sorry, a qualified degree and two years of experience, it still took me months to get in the door anywhere. I remember even then seeing junior design positions requiring three or more years of experience. Did you know that women are less likely to apply for a job if they don't think they meet 100% of the qualifications? By posting junior positions that require experience or having unreasonable qualifications, we're already turning away great, diverse candidates without realizing it, without needing to. And you could argue that we should be telling people to apply regardless of why. Why is it on them to be brave enough to challenge that expectation and not on our organizations and leadership to set reasonable standards? And if you're hesitant about a candidate, that's fair. You don't know someone all the time. Juniors aren't as networked as the rest of us. I recommend putting a system in place that allows you to test them based on a paid freelance or contract basis, or doing a test that is short and not related to the company work that you're doing. Now, I would actually prefer, and I can talk to you about this more later as well, I would say the best thing we can do is bring them in on a contract or freelance basis because they're actually doing work within the context of the environment that you've built, rather than doing some sort of irrelevant white boarding quiz. Oh my god, I didn't even know about those until like yesterday, and I was like, ugh, I could throw up. Like that sounds really stressful. The point I'm trying to get at is you can test people these days. And yes, you should pay them for their work. They are, still deserve to be paid. Um, 
And you could hire, excuse me, you could argue that the cost of hiring and training a junior is more expensive, but keep in mind that the time you take to hire and train a junior versus the time and resources it takes to hire a mid-level or a senior. Now, hiring a junior also means you get to have time training the needs from the ground up. So it's less about breaking bad habits and more about building the kind of person you want to work on your team. Now obviously, there are definitely situations where you can't bring a junior in. Like, I wouldn't, my boss, I wouldn't make you know, my boss a junior, that would be hard. Like, they have a lot to learn, of course they do. Um, and I would say, a little bit, just to answer that question, that there needs to be a balance between junior, mid, and seniors for a lot of good reasons. And we definitely have heard a few people talk about that over the past couple of days, um, and we can touch on it more too. Now, number three, stop hiring candidates based on who you know. Ensure candidates, if you do know them, interview with multiple leaders of different backgrounds. Now, I know this is counterintuitive for a lot of us because networking is like how we survive, uh, but this is an investment in building products with less bias. As we talked about a little bit, and I'm going to talk about more in a second, we are prone to liking people at these networking events, events that are a lot like us. So we tend to build teams, if we're using networking alone, with people like us. So it's a bit problematic. So yes, it's okay to network. Yes, it's good to get referrals. Just be sure to have an unbiased interviewing process as well. Let's talk about the history of PayPal. Hmm. and how that ties into the situation. Now, I know this image could use a lot more JPEG. Um, among the product development community in Silicon Valley, PayPal, the initial leaders, the initial team that built it, is called the PayPal Mafia. And this is a photo in, from 2007, which explains a little bit about why I literally couldn't find one that was actually good enough. Um, these are the people who did win big at the end of the dot-com boom, and they embraced the stereotype in a Fortune magazine photo shoot, so they are intending to look like mafia. It's not like a coincidence story. <laughs> but let's talk about what happened. Back in the 90s, Max Lepchin, Peter Thiel, and Luke Nosek founded a company called Confinity. And some of you probably know this, some of you might not. But to grow their company, Thiel recruited many of his classmates from his conservative college newspaper, the Stanford Review. While Lechen recruited most of the early engineers from his old college, University of Illinois, at Urbana-Champaign. Confinity, in an effort to stay viable, merged with X.com, which was founded by Elon Musk, for those of you who don't know, and the group adopted the name PayPal, because X.com sounded like an X-rated web website. Um, <laughs> the amazing thing about this is not just that these men hired their friends, but that many of the founders and leadership among PayPal after it was bought by eBay became millionaires and even billionaires who have become our investors. So, you can see a correlation between PayPal and YouTube and LinkedIn and Tesla and SpaceX and Facebook and Yelp and a lot of other companies. These men have literally influenced billions of lives. And I don't think anyone here meant to do that. I don't think anyone meant to create bias. But it happened. This is what happens with bias. No one needs to do things. No one realizes it's happening until it's far too late. This type of hiring breeds bias in the long run, even if, even if it's well-intentioned. And you may think that your company may never have that type of effect, but we are in an industry where we share code, we share research, we're sharing things all the time. Your work will affect people, even if it's not billions and trillions of people. It's going to at least affect hundreds, if not thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. Keep that in mind. Now, number four, take equal pay more seriously. Pay attention to your biases and what you consider worthy of a raise. Now, I want to talk about this one because I think a lot of us have heard that this is an issue. And for reference, 
Women in STEM-related careers, on average, make $16,000 less a year than their male peers. And if you're black or Latino, you might be making $14,000 less a year than your white coworkers. It's a pretty big gap. Even in companies like, like Google, who have a really well-documented history of diversity initiatives, have had this issue. So we know it exists, and we're trying to do what we need to do to fix it, but like, it's not working. Why? And first, I want to mention, I don't think there's a bunch of white guys in a room like laughing maniacally, like, oh, we're not going to give Anna a raise. <laughs> it's not, I doubt anyone works that way. You know, it's not really about that. It's more about a lack of awareness about what they're considering, what's being put up against individuals in different positions, and how people work differently. In a book called How Women Rise, Break the Twelve Habits Will Lead You Back, a book I would recommend for anyone who's looking on ways to actually grow within this industry, the authors explain that women are more prone to not asking for what they think they deserve. This means that in general, women assume that their work will speak for them. Women are also more likely to volunteer to be or to be assigned a task that aren't considered in terms of accomplishments when the time comes for reviews. Again, or rather, I should say, this is a generalization, and some of these rules do apply in different situations, and they don't apply in others, but this is a generalization. This does happen. It can make it more difficult for us to balance our normal tasks on top of additional expectations, making it harder to meet the same standards as our male peers. And then on the other hand, men tend to make it very clear what they want from the moment they are in the door, and they tend to decline tasks that don't make sense for them. That's just a generalization. Again. So when women negotiate for raises and promotions, we commonly ask for less, assuming that our managers know we are deserving of more, or that we are going to get it because our work has shown to be very good. That's not really the fault of women, it's the fault of leadership, not acknowledging that people do inherently work differently. Male, female, whatever background you come from, we work differently. You can argue that this is nature or nurture, but regardless of the reason, it's prevalent and problematic. A more likely scenario than these men laughing maniacally and like doing excellent movements, whatever, the bad seasons. Um, the more likely scenario is that Leadership is in a meeting, discussing who to give the promotion and the raise to. And what happens is they say, well, John's been asking for a promotion since nine months ago. And we can only afford to give this one promotion. We can't lose John. And Jane, by comparison, seems like she'll be happy regardless. So leadership opts to give John the raise and the promotion. And Jane is often left wondering why. This is part of the reason that women tend to leave tech and engineering jobs approximately two times faster than men. Of course, these are just, like, like I said, generalizations, and I've said that like three times. I just want to make sure I'm very clear on that. That being said, everyone does work differently, and leadership is obligated to know that people have different needs. They communicate things differently, and that's what makes what we do amazing. Like, if I was working with five Annas, the world would be chaos. Like, it would be so stressful. I would be so tired all the time. And I know that it took me some very special mentors to encourage me to be here today. I believe now that I deserve to be here after a lot of time and attention and communication about what I do and how I communicate. And sometimes we all need a little help, regardless. And finally, build an inclusive culture. Many of us believe we already have pretty inclusive cultures, but there's always work to be done. The tech community is regularly teased for being alcohol-fueled, work hard, play harder, dress code relaxed. That is somewhat accurate. Silicon Valley is a TV show, but there's a reason that a lot of us identify with it. And for a couple of references, the toxic cultures we're dealing with, <coughs> of the toxic cultures we're dealing with, 52% of tech employees believe their work environment is toxic. 
and 64% of individuals who identify as LGBTQ said that bullying was a big consideration for why they left a job. Inclusive cultures are what helps bring diverse teams together, keep them together, and help them rise. There's like a bazillion things you could do to build an inclusive culture, and that could be its very own presentation. So I included a link here for an article that I personally found really helpful on the subject. Um, because I can't go over everything that it takes to build an inclusive culture, I would just really encourage you to read it, um, because there's a lot of very small and subtle and nuanced considerations to have in there, such as the way you communicate, words that are inclusive, such as using they instead of guys, things like that. Um, so yes, definitely take a read. For reference, this is not about mandatory sensitivity training videos that people tend to ignore. Uh, it's more about broader company culture. And I want to say one thing that I think makes the biggest impact when it comes to building inclusive culture. I think it's about putting diverse individuals in leadership positions. It's probably the easiest way to start building a diverse and inclusive culture, because they can have an impact on the culture you've built. All right, so this, these are the five easiest ways to build diverse teams, but there's a, a lot, there's a lot of different ways. Those are the things we can do today. But, as I put these slides together, I knew there was no way I could go over everything I'd like to, or, or as in-depth as I hope. There's a lot of nuance to this, and they're based on our fundamental values and beliefs. So, I have one last piece of advice that I think we're all going to need to remember. Be ready to fail. We fail all the time. I fail like every day. I nearly tripped on this cord like seven times already. <laughs> Despite all sincere efforts to fix diversity and inclusion issues, it's not going to be fixed in this lifetime because true change <coughs> in culture takes generations. The tech industry is a reflection of our society and all of its issues pertaining to race gender, class, ability, age, and sexual orientation, and etc. However, failure is not an indicator of hopelessness. Not by any means. Every effort you make to advocate for diversity for your team, for people who are lateral to you, to people who work below you, to people above you, those things make a difference, as small as they seem. In these circumstances, our efforts are in part aspirational, but I encourage you to keep on trying because it's made a difference to me. It's made a difference to Jane. It'll make a difference to the future kids, the future leaders. And for those of you who want to do more, now I encourage you to get involved. I know that I kind of talked a little bit about this, but I've been volunteering for Tech Girls on kind of a whim for the past year, and it changed everything for me. Part of the reason I'm brave enough to be here today is because I did that. And 82% of the girls who attended our workshops changed their mind about working in tech, which is a pretty high number. Honestly, it's benefited me professionally and personally. I would say that part of the reason I got to be here today is because the people who worked on Developed Ember, and great work, by the way, wanted to talk more about inclusivity. The efforts I've done to teach these kids have put me ahead of people in my field because I've done more, I've gone above and beyond. It's made a difference for me personally, but yes, professionally as well. Thank you. Thank you for coming. And again, like I said, I'm going to go drink. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go drink. But let's talk about this. Like, I know I didn't leave a lot of time, but we're at the end of the day. We got time. If you have questions, feel free to ask. I think I might have lost someone, but that's okay. Yeah. What do you think about the area management team 
told not to ask someone what their previous working salary was? Does that can influence how much you have to pay them? Yeah, so the question was, what do you think of hiring managers not asking about what someone's previous salary was because that can influence your decision? Um, I heard some really great things on this over the past couple of days. My thinking is that although what really happens when someone's asking that question is they're going to try to lowball them. I know that's not inclusive or good language, but that's what's happening. <laughs> someone's trying to figure out the minimum they can give someone. And it, if you haven't already had a discussion about the job and the expectations, there's really no way I can give you a good number, you know? I can go Google the glass door average, but so can you. So why are you asking me that question, you know? So I think, you know, I understand on both sides, more on the, you know, someone who's interviewing side, but I'd say that you can, they should Google the average salary, what they have in budget, and take those considerations along with the qualifications, the diversity, the individual expertise someone brings to an organization, and then say, what does it take to get you here? And that comes after talking about everything, expectations-wise. And by the way, when that question is asked of me, I tend to say, this is the number I want, but if you give me an offer, and I can see your benefits, and I can see what other you know, factors go into this, I can actually negotiate this better. Some people prefer not to give a number. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, I recently moved here from Seattle, and I would be curious to know what you think are things that the Denver tech industry is doing really well as far as d and and what are some areas that you think they need to, you need to focus on? Yeah, and I, I'm repeating the question just so, just in case, but um, what is Denver doing that's a little behind in d and and what are they doing that's a little ahead of d and And for anyone's reference, d and means diversity and inclusion. Um, so, I'll tell you this, I've lived in Denver most of my life. That doesn't mean that I don't want to leave one day. But based on what I've read, and a lot of these statistics and a lot of these facts were based on a lot of the culture of Silicon Valley itself and not so much based in Denver. I would say that Denver is a newer tech community. And not to say newer, but we're getting a lot bigger. Um, and we have people who have a long legacy here, but not a lot of community here, like Silicon Valley did, does. Um, we have had the opportunity to learn by fire of the mistakes of Silicon Valley. I've seen people working really hard, individuals and organizations working hard to be inclusive in ways that I think are well-intentioned and sometimes they fall a little short. Like, for example, I've worked for companies that truly worked on building diverse teams, but it was kind of the Google conundrum. Google, for instance, for those of you who don't know, had diversity and inclusion efforts built into their organization, organization from the moment they started. And yet, you found that there were people still over drinking or you know calling people like, <coughs> bitch and stuff like that and 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 that's kind of the same problem I see here. We're really trying. We're doing really well at trying, and we have a lot that we're doing well. But when it comes time for like those sitting down in person interactions, we kind of fall short on the values we have prescribed to ourselves. So be conscious of how you're communicating with people. Even if they're not on your team or they don't work with you, like, or in this industry, hey, like, just be a little bit more conscious about how you communicate because you can leave people out. I'll also say that um, Denver, Denver has a lot of obvious growing to do in terms of racial diversity. Um, you probably noticed the moment you landed what this community looks like. And I think part of that comes from the fact that Colorado as a whole isn't super diverse, which I don't know 
why entirely. I'm sure there's some sort of systemic cultural implication there, but maybe we should start, you know, trying to give incentivize diverse candidates who come from other places. We have been seeing more of that too. I wish I could give you a better answer. I need to leave the state. I love it, but I need some diverse experience too. Unfortunately, we are out of time in this venue. Yeah. Well, thank you guys, you all, <laughs> so much. <laughs> I'm trying. We're all trying. Have a great weekend. <laughs>